Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Space Science with Python. Today we are concluding our side project on calibrating the cosmic dust analyzer on board the Cassini spacecraft. And as always, the code is available on GitHub, so the link is in the description and feel free to use all the parts for your own work, right? So we are taking a look at how to make a regression model, a calibration using Bayesian blocks today. We use the uh, hypermodel, Keras tuner and what have you. But all these things, they are not exclusively made for CDA or for Cassini. You can apply them to any other project you like. So laboratory work or instrument calibration or any other regression task. So feel free to recycle all the parts for all your needs. And as always, the code here is separated into different sections like read in the data, prior calibrations and so on. And all these parts, they are um, shown as uh, uh, marks here in this video. So feel free to jump in between if you are not interested in particular sessions. Let's directly dive into the code, I would say. And um, if you are not really into this topic here, you can jump directly to the outlook and summary where we will talk about what we do in the future. So let's go into read in the data. Uh, it's something we already did several times reading in the calibration data of CDA with all our filtering before. I'm not going too much into detail. Um, we did it several times now and I think yeah this is, uh, this is this is this is something I will not need to explain anymore. It's just some filtering of the data that we will use for calibration purposes. Now, our, also our prior calibrations are in there. Um, the things that I showed you, I think in a second video with all the functions and descriptions. So I would suggest to, um, to leave it as it is. And then we have our original data view. So let's take a look again at the data, how they look like, especially we take only a look at the impacts of <clears throat> dust particles on the larger target of CDA and the QI data. So if you don't know what I'm really talking about, take a look at the very first video of this site project. And we see here the velocity in kilometers per second on the Y axis. So the particle, what is the velocity of the particle that hits our instrument versus the rise time of our QI signal. If you don't know what the QI signal is, it doesn't, doesn't matter now. It's, it's a signal and its amplitude uh, or also its rise time of the signal strongly correlates with the impact velocity of the particle. And this is what you see here, but be aware the larger rise times on the left side and the smaller ones on the right side. So a shorter rise time corresponds to a higher velocity. So you can see here, this is our yeah, distribution. Um, now the question is, okay, how can we create our regression function on this yeah, two-dimensional data? For this, I am creating a Keras model, yeah, quite a simple one, neural network, but we want to sample weight our data, right? Because these data here in this center between 40 and 60 microseconds appears to be extremely overrepresented, while on the other hand, the shorter rise times, well, we have only a few data points. So we need to weight them during our training uh, process. And how do we do that? Well, there are different possibilities. One is, for example, to make a histogram, right? Creating bins and then weighting, creating weight based on the bins. But binning data is always some kind of, it's a little bit artificial. Right? You can also create a kernel density estimator. There's also a method and then you have like very small, yeah, theoretically infinite small intervals. Also doesn't sound that good. Um, I would suggest we introduce a new method called Bayesian blocks. And Bayesian blocks is something that is part of the library AstroPy. And Bayesian blocks are quite interesting. They are a histogram, but the uh, width of the histogram um, scales adaptively with the information density in the data. So you will see just in a moment how it looks like. Here in block number seven, I just created these, uh, I just executed here. And later I re reused the visualization part of AstroPy to create this histogram. But if you want to take a look at the data here, you can print them out. Now, if we look now at our histogram, 
you will see here's the um, the distribution, but the velocity is uh, is uh, shown logarithmically. Then you can see that the width really is scaling differently. Here you have a very broad block, here you have your smaller ones and so on. And this is now the intervals we will use to scale or to weight our data accordingly. The only issue though is, and this will you will see later, so there's still room for improvement, is this block here in the middle, this big one, because it covers velocities between only a few kilometers per second as well as some that are 40, 50 kilometers per second. So all, we, we see here there is like with the naked eye, you see there is like like, 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 a, like a gap or something. So it would be nice to have a, a split it here in this region, this region. But in this tutorial, in this video, we do it completely naive with the Bayesian blocks. So let's say we are not questioning the algorithm. Of course, you, as a scientist, you should always question everything. But here we just show the method, right? So the results will not be perfect, but it's a very interesting method to um, sample weight your training. The next step is that we apply this patient, this weightening on uh, in our data frame. This is what we do here. We are <clears throat> yeah, checking the uh, rise times and then sort or yeah, assigning them to the Bayesian blocks yeah, in, in some kind of group. So, Point, a point that is here is assigned to this block and so on. And then we create a weighting factor based on the height of the individual Bayesian blocks, which is being done in this part here. Additionally, you know, in machine learning, we need scaling and so on. And in this time for the rise time, we will use a min-max scaler. I will talk about this in a moment. And the y-axis, so the, uh, the output is not scaled uh, by a scaling function we are just applying our logarithm function. So you see here we scale already our data in a sufficient range. So this is what we do here. Now comes the next part. Um, we want to have a, f I mean, if a new, a new neural network will try to find a function that will move here through this distribution somehow, through this scatter plot. Let's take the linear plot maybe. Um, it will maybe, yeah, can even create here waves or something like that and increase and have a zigzag shape or something like that. But we would like, I mean, we see it already. We would like to have a increasing function, right? Like a monotonically increasing function or decreasing if you switch the X axis, which means that our output should not be, so the next step shouldn't be smaller than the previous step, right? So in this case, we want to have a function that increases over time, like the previous functions we have already uh, considered. And how do we do that? Because the loss function for regression is the mean squared error, the MSE. But thankfully, in TensorFlow and Keras, we create, can create our custom functions. And we create here now our custom loss function that yeah, enforces this kind of monotonically increasing or decreasing shape. How do we do that? Well, we have a cell here, the what I call the decreasing loss. Yeah, you take the um, you take the predicted values and you shift it, and then you compute the differences between the values. And then, if the difference is um, for an increasing for a for a, for a decreasing loss, if it's uh, positive, then it's yeah, it's 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 added to some kind of loss function. So, how does it look like? Let's take an example. We have, um, we have values like 20, 19, 15. So it decreases, decreases, and then between 10 and 11, it increases. Yeah, this is what we do not want to have. What happens? Well, this part computes the differences between uh, consecutive data points. And then we take a ReLU function. So we have here like minus one, minus four, and then minus five and plus one. So the ReLU function will return zero everywhere but for the parts where we have the increase here from 10 to 11. So it's one. And then we sum up all the values and this is our loss function. So you have here a small example where you see here the consecutive differences and then the, what I call the violation term, which is in here only one. And if you sum it up, it's one again. Now, if you have a lot of violations, then this loss will be huge. Yeah, of course you have to do take into account that it could be a different order of magnitude compared to the MSE. But the good thing is that when all 
consecutive elements are decreasing, this error will be zero. So it will be non-existing and that should be the goal. Of course, there's room for improvement. You will see that later. In our next part, we built our hyper model as we already did in the last times. Um, there's no magic involved here, just some layers where we play around with our values. Keras Tuner will check it out. Most importantly is that in our loss, we add now our decreasing loss there and also some kind of loss weights. Yeah, so the loss weight is um, something, uh, so, so the, the, the losses in Keras are the one loss, the total loss is loss one plus loss two. And you can add a scaling factor uh, before the losses. So if you want to say, hey, the mean square error is way more important. I want to have a 10 times higher weight than the other one. You can do it here. Now it's one one, so same weight. But um, this is also half the logic because sometimes if you add costume losses, a costume loss can be always an order of magnitude higher. Then you have to scale it accordingly to be really careful what really happens in the background. But here in this case, we keep it simple. These are some parameters you may, uh, you may use for uh, improving it. Now we have our here our callback function where we monitor the validation loss with a patience of 10 uh, epochs and then we restore the best weights. This is our tuner with a 5k fold cross validation. We already did this last time. But now the important thing is um, we are not using, and I know this is a little bit bad habit, but we are not using test data. We only have our training and validation data because our calibration is done. We do not have any future calibration data anymore, only science data, but science data cannot be used for calibration purposes. So you want to have the, you want to use as many data as possible to, to, to train our algorithm. But of course we have to be careful regarding um, overfitting. So we have of course a validation set of 10% and the splitting of the data is based on the Bayesian blocks. Yeah. So the Bayesian, so we have here our data. The first column is the rise time and we have our output, the velocity, and then at the very end, the weight factors. Another thing is also our loss function. We have now our, um, the, Increasing? No, wait a second. In, in our increasing loss, I don't know the name. How how I mentioned it? Uh, decreasing loss. Um, we have to take care that our data is also sorted. So we have to sort them by the rise time, and then later when we fit our model, we have to set the value shuffle equals false. So if you have time series data or data where the order is important then you should always um, deactivate the shuffling because here in our case, uh, the loss function only works when the next, because the, the, then the next step depends on the previous step. And if the values are randomly shuffled, then the loss function is pretty much useless. So this is what you need to consider here. So this is now our, uh, our min max scaling. Also here, the scaling we apply to all data and normally you have the training uh, validation where you make the transformation and then you apply it to the test data. But here we apply it to all data at once because, well, take a look, for example, at images. Images scale between zero and 255. You don't need to really do a training test split on the scaling. In our case, our data is scaled between zero and 80 microseconds. Yeah, this is based on the calibration. So, um, there will be no future data that will be 90 microseconds or so. Yeah, So all this data are squeezed between zero and one. And then we can do our training. On my computer, I took around 15 minutes, um, 25 trials, maximum of 100 epochs with uh, early stopping based on the validation laws with a patience of 10 steps. And then in the next part, we can extract the best ML model. So this is our best model here. A pretty simple one, uh, three, three layers basically only, and then we can use the same method again to re to train our best model now. Yeah, so we decrease the batch size a little bit, and then we do the same thing again here, and then you see here the validation, uh, the loss, f the loss of the, the the loss and the validation loss they decrease, and then you, at some point you stop the training process and you're done. 
Let's take a look at the final model. So we use the rise times now um, from, yeah, here is from 5 to 80 microseconds. And then we apply them to our model to predict some values and then to plot them with our scatter plot. And this is how it looks like. So you see that, well, it's still not, yeah, it's a little bit violating one of the losses, but again, the complete loss function is based on these two parts. So it's still okay, I would say, if an or almost horizontal line in this part. One could even argue whether this line is a little bit not overestimating the calibration here in this part. Here, well, it could be, it looks like it's underestimating the higher velocities. So yeah, how does it compare to the previous functions we have? here the plot of the one from Srama 2000-2009 and there we see that well the shape is almost the same but we have some deviations of course and these deviations well you can still improve the weights of the different losses you can improve the neural network with more parts and um, from a personal feeling but well feeling don't really matter and feelings don't really matter now in, in, a, in a data scientific case I would also I also think that our function is now overestimating a little bit this part and underestimating this part here. So what one could also do now is um, improve the loss function. Say, hey, um, take a look at um, smaller rise times, right? For example, um, or we could also apply these now to science data and see if the results also make sense or not. So this is something maybe for the future in the, in a, when we do our science cases. Um, and I think it's also a nice method now for you using all the building blocks now for your own laboratory work. So um, try to play around a little bit with it. Again, the link is in the description. I have the feeling that in the last couple of weeks, uh, the complexity of our projects was increasing and increasing. I hope some of you are still following me. Maybe it's a little bit too complex or sometimes a little bit too boring because it's very niche topic. So from my suggestion would be now that I go back to the uh, general videos where I will talk more about uh, planets again and comets and more, let's say, simpler stuff, basic stuff. And I would also like to reshape the GitHub repository a little bit to clean it a little bit up. So I would suggest this is the next step I do now. And I hope, I still hope you enjoyed the session. And with CDA, we will do a lot of more things. So really also science stuff. Yeah, it will be really amazing. We will, for example, determine uh, interstellar particles. So we will derive the direction where our solar system is flying to. And I think this will be a great, uh, this will be great months ahead. So. Thanks again for watching, enjoy the code, apply it to your own stuff and see you next time.